Welcome to the grand final part two edition of In the Ballpark. And of course, you are joined here by Serpers, Maxi, and Fryzy, ready to deliver one hell of a package on grand final eve. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Fantastic to have you here. I'm reporting live from the suburbs. Raising hell here. All the Demon fans are going absolutely nuts. And Fryzy, by the looks of things, you've exited the retirement village in Springfield and you've entered the 1954 grand final. Good evening, another week. We're finally here. It took us long enough. The last week and a half has certainly dragged on. It's felt more like a month or two, but nonetheless, we are now closer and closer, which is great. Yes, fellas, very interesting. Uh, I've, I've kind of gone, uh, you know, from... Um, visiting uh, the elderly last week. And uh, as you can see, the, the players uh, and spectators from 67 years ago behind me here, if any of them are still going, I'd imagine they're very elderly now as well. So a little trip down memory lane. Of course, the last time that uh, these two sides played in a grand final. And of course, as we know, the Bulldogs, most recent one prior to 2016. So incredible scenes. There you have it there. There is the MCG some 67 years ago. It's it's quite extraordinary. Boys, a bit of a head scratcher for me the last couple of days. I'm not sure if either of you can answer. Is there any recollection of these two teams perhaps playing off in a, in a final of any kind since? Apart from, I think it was 2018 when Melbourne made the finals and they played in a prelim, Melbourne have been pretty rubbish for, for a good long while. And I suppose the Bulldogs, um, they played finals in 2016 and I think they've played finals most of the season since. And then they had as we sort of refer back to oftentimes, the Rodney Ead sort of Nathan Eagleton era around the the sort of 2008 to 2010-ish sort of range. But yeah, I can't remember these two teams playing in a final. I haven't really changed my stance from last week and I'm so happy to see both of these teams in the finals. And I tell you what, on Instagram, the, the flavour of the finals is well and truly alive. There are multiple fan pages where they've got all the different houses coloured in the red, white and blue or the red and the blue. And it looks absolutely sensational. There are dogs, fellas. And I know I like my animals on the show here. There are dogs that, are, that have got their own little fleeces, jackets, and they're all the different colours, little demon ears. It's absolutely fantastic to see. And I'm sure there's a lot of bulldogs still humping plenty of the mascots. Sort of looks like kill or it's not too right. It does. <laughs> I think this might be a log house, Maxie. But <laughs> this is this is a bit of a homemade job by the looks of things. <laughs> the, the spray can's been pulled out. You continue to impress week after week with uh, extraordinary backdrops. And look, it really sums up, I think, things like that. You know, the, the extent that fans are going to go to as part of this week. It is a great week on the calendar, or weeks, I should say, for this particular season. Um, when we were in it, the week off, it's kind of felt empty, but I suppose it was necessary for the Bulldogs to get out of quarantine. But sort of since once we've come through the Brownlow and we've sort of turned a corner, like the momentum starting to build. I don't think the pre-grand final week is going to be here to stay, if I'm honest, but in the circumstances, I don't think it's hurt the course too much. It's been a strange week. Certainly last week, I think you come off those two big preliminary finals and that Sunday, obviously, you bask in the glory of both of those teams being able to get to the grand final and sort of celebrate just how good it's going to be. And then sort of for a whole week, I think if you're both the clubs, you're hoping you don't get many injuries. And, you know, every now and again, you hear a news report pop up. Oh, Charlie Spargo's came off a training session a little bit sore, you know, and you sort of think to yourself, oh, no, you know, how many players are we going to lose in this week? But thankfully, when you get into this week, you know, the training really goes to another level. And it's been great to see the photos as well, gents. And I'm sure both clubs have been doing their media priorities since. And yeah, the week has really started to go to another level. And you're absolutely right, Maxi, getting that momentum out of the Brownlow Medal Night. And we probably should touch on the Brownlow Medal Night, gentlemen, because it is one of my favourite nights of the year. Gentlemen, can you remember a count ever being this high? The amount of players that managed to get into the 30s. I mean, it's hard to believe that 20 or 30 years ago, the players who won the Brownlow Medal were only polling 17, 18 votes. Concentration of votes on the particular the star midfielders, and you kind of wonder... You know, what are the factors that go into that? Is that just because they're under the umpire's nose all the time? Or is it perhaps because, you know, umpires are humans, they pay attention to who the media are talking about. And they also, you know, there's plenty of sports gambling advertised on, you know, across both social media and across the TV 
nowadays. So if that sort of gets into the umpire's head and sort of just like it's a subconscious thing that, you know, they're looking at Wines, they're looking at Bontempelli, they're looking at Oliver. But as you said, there's four blokes who ended up in with 30 votes. So Wines with 36, which is insane. Then Bont, Oliver and Walsh, as well as our boy Darcy Parrish on 26, along with Jack Steele. And then also Mitchell Boak and Petrarca in the sort of mid to lower 20s. So it's interesting, but as you said, it was one of the more entertaining um, counts in recent times because you think of the last probably five or six or even longer years, there's usually a clear front runner. And I think Boat um, Wines, he went into the count as favourite, but going into the count and even through the count, you thought, geez, at one point I thought Sam Walsh might have won it. And then you think Oliver got off to a really good start and then Bontebelli had a lead, but he sort of... You know, the Bulldogs lost their last three games. He th- sort of thought Wines is going to track him down because I think Wines was said to poll in the last three games, whereas Bontepelli didn't. But, yeah, the, like the last few years, like I was just talking about, you had like Lockie Neal, um, Tom Mitchell, Dusty, and even Danger a few years ago. Like, you, you kind of knew who was going to win going into the night. And Wines, he was the favourite. But, yeah, like it was a really entertaining count. I'm with you on that. Uh, you know, four four guys over 30 is obviously not not happened before. And 36 as a win, we know it's uh, only the second time that's happened. He's picked up over a vote and a half a game on on an average. There, only one. 16. He, like he pulled in like 16 games or something crazy. Yeah, j- just uh, just remarkable. And I, I guess um as well as as you mentioned there, Maxi, there's tends to be a bit more of a, a clear runaway candidate. And then you've got the others in the last few rounds who may still catch up, but you probably know which way it's going to go. I like this. This went down to the last round. In fact, even the last one to two games to be red. So that's excellent um, from a viewing perspective. Uh, superb. Secondly, whether or not um, some sort of uh, compensation, if you like, award for, for key position players should, should coexist with the Brownlow as well. I think I'm right in saying that the entire top 10 this time around were all players that you'd consider to be midfielders. So I think it's only natural that this conversation now comes up and we know it's come up quite often in the past. I, I don't know. Do, do, uh, do either of you boys have any strong thoughts on, on those areas? Probably the big game that was touched on after the Brownlow medal count happened was when GWS went down to Geelong and Sam Taylor had an absolutely outstanding game. He was marking absolutely everything and he kept Tom Hawkins out of that match completely. And he didn't even get a single vote for that game. And in those moments, you just love to see the players get recognised for that, particularly those defensive players. The midfielders pretty much own the Brownlow medal and they have for quite some time. Yes, you have exceptions over time. Tony Lockett, Jim Steins. There's been a few, but for the most part, it it is a midfielder's medal. And then you've got the Coleman, which is obviously your goal kicker's medal, but there's nothing really other than maybe the Golden Fist, which is something of recent times. There's nothing really official that the AFL are offering for defensive players. Yes, obviously you've got to pick your back line in the All-Australian squad and then eventually get your blazer, but... Other than that, no, there's not really a standalone award for the defenders, which you probably want to see because players like Jake Lever and Stephen May, I mean, just look at the effects that they have had on the Demons this season. Appropriate as well, I think, guys, that we touch on uh, the the vote givers being the umpires and whether or not there's a bit more contention around that. Is that something that in the future realistically could change? And we, and we see whether it's um, coaches' votes that get allocated or there's a specific panel arranged to do that uh, i'm not sure where where do you guys see that one heading firstly as an umpire for IC, do you think it's sort of distracting that the umpires sort of at the end of the day they have two jobs to officiate the game and then think about you know am i going to pay this holding the ball am i going to pay this ruck free kick and at the end of the game you've got to think about everything that you've just seen and think geez who are the three best players and you sort of maybe you just think about the players who you've spent sort of the most time watching who are obviously going to be midfielders so as an umpire, do you think it's too tough tough of a job to officiate the game and ju- a judge who's been the best on the ground? It's an incredibly difficult task. As you said, when, once you're, you're out there, you're focusing on what's in front of you. You sort of sit down post-game and, and go, well, hang on. I really haven't had a chance to 
to think about this. So it's not a surprise that the midfielders, you know, are the ones that come into consideration the most. Just wonder whether or not going forward, it's it's something that might get a bit of momentum to uh, to perhaps look at changing that. The Brownlow in the earlier days used to be a media award and then they changed it to the umpire. So I actually think traditionally or, or, or at some point, potentially in the 70s, it used to be a media voted award and then they changed it to the umpire. So potentially history could be involved in recent times, but... Yeah, I don't necessarily think people would mind as long as you get a fair outcome and all the free key positions that we've mentioned are covered. And you probably do want to see players who, you know, play pretty damn well in the back line and get some more votes. I think the uh, the fallout of Sunday night's league has probably only fueled this, this discussion. Um, when Gavin Wanganeed won it for Essendon, he won it with something like 18 votes, which is half of what Wines ended up with. <laughs> That's quite extraordinary. Gentlemen, I've got to say real quick, I mean, we're talking about the play on words with wines. Him grabbing a beer at the ceremony, I was just waiting for him to pick up a glass of red and hold it up high. I was going, come on. He's a Nechuga boy. (laughs) He's beer beer through and through. But I think you're onto something there. If he starts his own wine label, it might be a bit of a cash cow. Glad that it's been mentioned because that that does feel like a little uh, opportunity gone knocking there. I remember when Luke Beveridge first came into to coaching, I thought, gee whiz, post-coaching career Luke Beveridge, surely instead of Jimmy Brings, it's Beveridge Brings. That is just great. I think maybe the only thing that lacks from per stadium or Optus Stadium as we call it, is the fact that those boundaries are just so high up. You don't get those Collingwood supporters literally licking your ear when you have a shot at goal tied on the boundary line. That's probably the only thing that's lacking, but equally... You could probably see why they have done that, probably for that sole reason, Jets. You guys probably will recall a, a bit of the chat came, no doubt, from the Collingwood camp, especially after that game about the the particular instance where Sheed takes the mark and whether or not Braden Maynard was blocked out in that mm-hmm. particular contest. And funnily enough, that umpire that was on the spot at the time, Brett Rosebury, he's one of three in lining up for this Saturday night. Matt Stevick, of course, two, two guys... Um, that have really been at the at uh, the top of their job for years and years. Interestingly enough, it's their ninth grand final each for both of them. Uh, and I think I'm right in saying that Stevic has done an extraordinary eight in a row now with this one coming up included in that. The third is uh, is Jacob Mollison, who actually makes his grand final debut. So isn't that interesting? You've got two of the most experienced, uh, you know, best in the in the game, been there, done that so many times, and then another in, in for his first grand final. So... Guys, there you go. Unfortunately, Razor Ray misses out. Now we're going to have to endure a, a grand final without him. It's a it's a sad day for football. It's it, look, it's one of the blackest days in Australian sport. I think I'd be I'd be right in saying. I know we've had a few of them, but this is surely up there. I mean, you know, we talk about the night grand final and you know the the lights, the spectacle, the entertainment. You want entertainment? Well, Ray is your man. This is absolutely ridiculous. They get the birds of Tokyo in pretty much as soon as they find out it's in Western Australia. An umpire called Sam Walsh, I'm assuming it isn't the the one that holds so well in the Brownlow. That that would be controversial. But Sam Walsh is on the bench. And I believe Michael. there's also a Michael Barlow that's also in... He, he might be one of the boundary umpires. Now, I assume it's not Michael Barlow from the Fremantle Dockers and, of course, the Gold Coast Suns. But Friends hey, the show. who knows? <laughs> In the ballpark, favourite, of course. Now, I'm pretty sure it's pretty sure it's not him. I know those footballers tend to keep nice and fit, but no, I I don't think uh, that's our man. Who would have thought? Maybe it's a more common name than we realised. For those listeners out there who are big fans of Curb Your Enthusiasm, I'm looking at photos of Jacob Mollison. I'm telling you, gents, he is Mocha Joe. He is Mocha Joe. I am telling you, he is a, a spinning image of him. I like that, Serbs, and uh, there you go. I, I <laughs> hadn't thought it before. I mean, this 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 young man's actually been, I, I don't know how young he is, but he's been in the AFL system for some time, you know, well over a decade. So I guess this week uh, culminates a great story of persistence, if you like, perhaps the same sort of persistence that you've got to give a lot of credit to the Demons fans for, particularly those that have been through a whole long mostly painful ride prior to this. And of course, as we know, this bunch of Bulldogs fans went through a very similar thing, you know, prior to 2016. So it's probably something that, uh, you know, 
10 or so years ago, if someone even mentioned the thought of these two teams playing off in a grand final, you would have thought it was a long, long way off. So there you have it. And gents, isn't it incredible as well that we've got another all Victorian grand final and it's another year that we've been interstate with our competition. I mean, it really says a lot about these Victorian clubs really galvanising in these tough periods of time. Getting away in those hubs are clearly helping them out somehow. Their psychology, they've got it the right way. They've got their team culture hot and strong. And it's a real credit for both these four Victorian sides over the last two years to be able to get to the big dance interstate and play most of their finals interstate too as far as like the the away event the home and away advantage or the travel advantage that especially like the perth teams and in the brisbane teams it's going to be really interesting the next few years like whether or not that sort of advantage is going to dwindle a little bit because the melbourne teams have spent so much time on the road the last few years you wonder whether like west coast playing in perth is that going to be as big as a big an advantage in the next few years as it was, say, before pre-COVID, where team where the Victorian teams were only travelling six or seven times a year, or however however many times it is. But you're right, Serp, about the Victorian teams the last two years. But I suppose the Brisbane Lions will be kicking themselves for a long time. Last year, that they didn't make the most of it, and the Perth teams neither of them made, even made the finals this year. So you're right, <laughs> you're right. It's gonna be it's, it's gonna be interesting the next few years. Yeah, how, um, how that travel advantage plays out. We talk about, uh, you know, travelling and away teams, things like that. Found out just prior to us jumping on the show here tonight, neither side will need to wear their clash jumper for, for this weekend's game. It was talked about a little bit, wasn't it, in past years? You know, I think back to, to when Frio had to, had to wear the white uh, in their first grand final. That was criminal. It was criminal. criminal. It was, it was, it didn't make a lot of sense. And then of course there was there was a little bit of conversation as well when when the Tigers won their first of the three wearing the alternate jumper against the Crows. Pretty sure the Giants 2019. Um that made no sense either. That that was another one of those where you, you just can't work it out. Who decided that there's a clash between Fremantle and Hawthorne? And perhaps the 2019 grand final was even worse, considering that. Those teams played in the 2017 preliminary final where the where the Giants just wore their normal home strip with white shorts. And somehow in two years, a clash has somehow developed. You know, the psychological advantage of that thinking, you know, <laughs> even if we do win this premiership, we're literally just a white balance in our photo. I mean, how ridiculous is that? And I have been campaigning for this for quite some time. And I am really glad that common sense has prevailed, gents. Yeah, regardless of who wins, we're not going to be complaining about the fact that there's a little bit too much white in the Guernsey. No, that's it. And look, it really is a you know a minor, rather insignificant topic. But gee, I, I just can't get over that, Maxie, what you just mentioned, that, that someone somewhere has decided that in the space of two years between Richmond playing the Giants, that all of a sudden there is a clash. Gents, hard to believe that this Saturday is the 2021 AFL Grand Final at night. And of course, it is the Melbourne Football Club in their first Grand Final since 2000 when they played our old mob up against the Western Bulldogs who they played in 1954 in the Grand Final. Gentlemen, let's have a look at the lineups. We're recording this on a Tuesday, so we don't quite yet have the teams with the Medi subs, but... Gentlemen, what a great clash and what a hard-fought midfield battle this is going to be. They both bat really deep. And, of course, it's going to be one of the best defensive sides in the comp up against one of the highest scoring sides in the comp. What a contest we are going to have. But, gents, in my eyes, there is one standout man that could potentially rip this game apart if the Bulldogs aren't on their game. And I think you know who I'm talking about, gents. Who, man? Maxi Gorn, the big man. The Bulldogs all year have admitted that their ruck stocks aren't necessarily the best. And, gents, we talked about one field umpire running around the ground. Well, gee whiz, Steph Martin, <laughs> good luck chasing Max Gorn around the ground because he has an unbelievable work rate. Gents, if the Bulldogs, quite simply, can't stop Max Gorn, is this the Demons grand final? Well, if he plays anything like he played in the preliminary final, then yes. But um, you're right. Like when I like picture this game in my head, I picture the midfield battle. I picture that first centre bounce and all the names who are going to be in there. Like for the Demons, you think of Gorn, Petrucca, Oliver, Viney, Harms, Brayshaw and Langdon on a wing. And then the Bulldogs, you think, well, Stefan Martin and Tim English are going to have to go against Max Gorn. So 
you wonder if maybe there's, you know, it sort of brings it back to a little bit of even if they sort of um, they sort of tag team against Gorn. I know Luke Jackson will also play a bit of ruck. So, may I think that's where um, Melbourne will definitely have an advantage. But then the Bulldogs midfield, we've talked about it all year with Font, McRae, Libba, Smith, Trelaw, and then Hunter on a wing and Dunkley. So, yeah, I can't wait to see how that midfield plays out. Look, it is, it is the key battle, isn't it? It's the one thing we can't wait to see, to be fair. Um, as we sort of mentioned last week, very arguably the two strongest midfields in the comp. I don't think many people would uh, dispute that too much. Look, I know there's been a lot of chat in the pre-game build-up. And of course, as I said, that build-up's felt like it's gone for a long time now. But look, we're nearly there. We're only a few days out now, which is great. A lot of conversation around uh, both sides, each having a female president at the helm, which that that is extraordinary and, uh, you know, quite, um, you know, a notable uh, achievement, I must say. But I'm really, really intrigued in that that midfield battle. As you said, that is the one. Um, two incredible units going head to head. I look, I don't know whether or not we've we've got the two best teams on the whole year overall in the grand final. Maybe we do. We've certainly got two that are in some extraordinary form if last week is anything to go by. As we as we touched on um, during that show, it's not often you see both preliminary finals, the defeats in such gravity, that manner. It's 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 very uncommon. Maybe you might get one, but uh, two just almost never happens. So they're certainly the two standout sides at the moment that deserve to be there. I don't think anyone is going to challenge that either. Jake Lever, he has been in extraordinary form this season and he has really been on top of his game with his intercept marking, knowing when to leave his man, take intercept marks and really set up play from that impressive back line. Of course, Stephen May, we all expect him to be right to go in this game, but you don't want to see him going on too many leads with Aaron Norton. You probably want to see him playing that wicket-keeping role, stopping all the ball from getting really deep inside that forward 50 for the Bulldogs. But particularly if you're a Bulldog supporter and obviously the coaching staff of the Bulldogs, you are thinking to yourself, how do you limit the effectiveness of Jake Lever? And gentlemen, Josh Shackey had an incredible shutdown role when he was playing in the preliminary final against Alia Alia, who was in all Australian form, just like Jake Lever. Gents, do you see Shaki potentially playing that role or will Jake Lever pretty much go to whoever he wants, peel off and pretty much dominate the game? How do we see this matchup playing out? Interesting because, you know, like the obvious matchup for the Bulldogs would just to put um, Shaki on Lever's back shoulder, but... From a Melbourne perspective, you might just say to leave a go and play on the Western Bulldogs' le- um, least like dangerous forward. So you could see a bit of a ring a ring a rosy where everyone's just trying to fly- follow the next bloke. But um, I was listening to David King, and from a tactical battle, he said this is probably the most interesting point that the Bulldogs tend to roll up a forward to each of the um, to the stoppages. So that's usually Trelaw or Bailey Smith. But the danger in that is that if they do that this week, then that's probably going to let off either one of Salem or Lever. So if, if they do roll up their forwards to the stoppages, could that allow Melbourne to get Lever free? So that's just an interesting point. So when you're watching the game, just have a look to see if the Bulldogs are playing with an extra at stoppages and if that does allow um, Jake Lever to get free. The thing that's really intriguing here is, and we sort of touched on it a moment ago, you know, you've got the two contrasting game styles, really. I mean, watching that wrestle unfold there between each side, trying to get it on their own terms, they certainly don't play the same way at the best of times. You know, we know that they're, they're very, very different, a really difficult one to, to pick, I think, in that regard. Yeah, and it was very interesting when I was watching these two teams come up against each other for the first time they played this season, which was at Marvel Stadium by memory. I remember after the game, Christian Petrarca talking about a little way that the Demons approached their game style, which was trust the tackler. And I found it very fascinating. When I watched back the game, you notice that usually only one player goes after the play with the ball, which means that Melbourne have more players on the outside of the contest. Say, for example, if that ball gets turned over, Melbourne can chain their handballs out and they can exit the stoppages quite easily or at least exit that congestion quite easily. And it's a very fascinating style. Now, obviously, the Bulldogs won that most recent encounter, but they had Josh Bruce on their side, who in both of those encounters kicked a fair few goals. So it'll be fascinating to see who steps up and kicks most of the doggies' goals. But I found it very interesting, gentlemen. Trust the tackler. 
Those demon players really trying to slap down the hands. A lot of those fend-offs weren't quite working. They were tackling well. Their pressure was frenetic. I mean, that's probably one of the big benefits of demons having this extra week off is the fact that, you know, they play such a high-pressure game. Like, I'm tipping Melbourne to win um, by 12 points. Going by that, I'm predicting that Simon Goodwin will he'll get, get what he needs out of his players because I think Melbourne have been the best team all year. I've been saying that for the last few weeks. So I'm predicting Melbourne to win by 12 points. I'm going to go down a very similar path. I'm for, I've ended up with Melbourne by 10. I feel a little bit nervous riding off the Bulldogs, and I, I don't want it to, to seem that way at all. They do seem to, as you mentioned about their coach as well, just finding ways, uh, creating solutions, if you like, um, even if they weren't quite able to do it as consistently as Melbourne during the season, seem to find a way to rise to each occasion. They've done it so far. You know, remember they, of course, started in an elimination final. They've risen each time and found a way to surprise so that is what makes the choice a really tough one um but still melbourne just gentlemen i am gonna disagree with you on this one i am gonna tip the western bulldogs to win their third premiership in their history i think the build-up has primarily been focused on the demons and of course breaking that 57 year hoodoo i mean what an incredibly long time to wait for a Demon supporter. And it hurts me to say this prediction because, of course, I know about so many of these great Demon supporters who have hung in there through really difficult times. I think the Bulldogs, with that 2016 experience, I feel like a lot of those players sort of that were pretty young playing in that premiership, like your Bonton Pallies, your McRae's, your Lockie Hunters, they are going to be primed and they are going to know the exact feeling of what it's like to run out onto that ground and to handle that pressure and handle that heat early. And I think Luke Beveridge's experience as well is really going to help on the day. The big question is, can they kick a winning score? And particularly against that Demons backline, but... I think if they come in with a game plan, particularly with Max Gorn, I think that goes a long way to them winning. So I'm tipping the doggies. But again, gents, I think it's going to be under three goals. I think this is going to be a very close grand final. And it's exactly the one that we're hoping for. I'm going to tip the doggies, but it would be great to see the Demons break that 57-year drought. I must say quickly on the Demons as well, gentlemen, I love the storylines that come out on grand final week. And one of the best ones I think I've came across, and th- this is one pretty close to home as well, being Essendon supporters, is Michael Hibbert. Of course, he's playing in his first ever grand final. Of course, a great servant for the Bombers. Pig, we used to call him. And uh, I think he's Terrelgan boy. You know, got to love that about him. But he's playing for a couple of reasons. He's playing for his brother who unfortunately passed away. It's a very sad tale but he's also playing for the 34 Essendon players who, of course, went through the terrible drug saga. So to Michael and to his family and to the reasons why he's playing, I salute you and I hope you get that dream finish because he's been a great servant for the Dons and he's done a lot for the Ds. It looked like at one point there he wouldn't get into the side, but glad that he is playing there and playing for those reasons. It's brilliant. And then you look across the park at Mitch Hannon. He played for the Footscray VFL team, went on to play for the Demons, and then he's back in red, white, and blue colours playing against his old side in a grand final. Mitch Hannon Cup. That is great. That is a great story, gents. It's the Stephen May situation as well. There always seems to be a player under an injury cloud as well. So it just makes for... Real fascinating, juicy reading, doesn't it? They come up pretty regularly, don't they, these sort of stories? We saw it, uh, of course, with the the last grand final the Bulldogs were in Richmond the following year. I know those ones more specifically to do with, you know, premiership droughts, you know, the long, enduring wait, things like that. There's a real theme of that, of course, coming in with Melbourne. The Bulldogs fans know only too well what that's about. There's not many others that that could match them um, in that regard. But now, of course, here we have... Melbourne. So look, maybe, maybe all those storylines considered, it, one might say it'd be fitting. It's going to be an extremely special grand final, that is for sure, gentlemen. Now, of course, it wouldn't be a grand final preview without giving our tips for the Norm Smith medal and for the first goal kicker and then our exact margins for the game. Maxi, let's start with you, the Norm Smith medalist, the first goal kicker, and your exact margin tip for the grand final. Uh, I said earlier, Melbourne by 12 points. For the first goal score, I'm going to go Aaron Norton. It is the matchup that I'm a little bit worried about just 
based on, I don't know how um, Stephen May's hamstring, how big of a worry it is. Maybe he's f- absolutely fine. But, yeah, I, just in my mind, I can see Aaron Norton just flying at a back and bringing, it, bringing down a mark early in the game. So I'm going to go for Aaron Norton to kick the first goal. And for the Norm Smith, I'm going big Maxi Gorn to have a ripper. I was nearly going to say Maxi for the... For the first goal, in fact, just because he, he he'd still be in the, the rhythm of kicking goals after that From second 60. <laughs> last week. Goodness me, just doing it for for fun. It was like it was just a you know a random uh, training drill. Where he wasn't even trying. It looked just so effortless at times. I'm going to go with the Bont for Norm Smith. I know I have of course picked the Demons by ten. Weirdly, I I, I love the idea of a, a losing side player picking up the middle. I know it doesn't happen very often, but we've seen it from time to time. Something about it in a close grand final, don't really know why, but uh, I, I think it's just fabulous. Am I allowed to say Mitch Hannon for the first goal? It, <laughs> of course. Perhaps just something magical about that, if it were the case. Just a bit uh, a bit too much romance involved there in that prediction, but I'm, I'm going to stick with it regardless. The first goal scorer of the game is going to be Benjamin Brown. I think big Benny Brown is going to mark it strong on the gotcha. lead and kick it for about 45 metres out on a slight angle, potentially a 45 degree angle, and it's going to be a beautiful sausage roll. And then the Norm Smith medalist, I'm going to tip Adam Trelaw. That's right. He's going to finally get his first premiership and he's going to be running all day. He's going to be on top of the ground and he's going to kick a couple of sausage rolls on the run as well. So I'm going to tip Adam Trelaw for the Norm Smith. And my exact margin is going to be the Western Bulldogs by 19 points. I like it. And uh, look, the Trelaw pick as well. It's a good one. Of course, that 2018 grand final heartbreak and then with the fallout leaving Collingwood there. And uh, again, so many potential stories in this. What is our most unexpected thing that you see happening on the day? Now, gents, I've just looked at the forecast. 25 degrees, partially cloudy. Not that that's going to matter at night, but potentially there shouldn't be any delays with lightning. That's good, boys. We don't want that because, of course, it was the demons that were playing there that night as well, wasn't it, this season with the with the lightning issue? Now, I'm, I'm going to go with, uh, well, one thing that, is possible to be seen, but we hope we don't see, is for uh, delays in the arc. Now, we simply can't have that. St Kilda fans. Oh, yes. (laughs) You're still filthy about it, let me assure you. Not a good sight at all. I tell you, no, the only other thing that would top it, I, I, you guys probably remember way, you know, way back, was probably a 90s, early 2000s thing where they, they sometimes used to have someone fly in either with the cup or the, or the match ball, I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, so what, are we, are we going to see, uh, are we perhaps going to see Eddie? Is that going to be Eddie's <laughs> last, last ditch attempt to, to get into the grand final? Eddie, Eddie's going to somehow be just parachuted in over the top. Yeah, it'll be the Prince of Perth, Basil. I don't know, Maxie, are they going to have a big enough landing strip for his nose? (laughs) Gents, if I had to predict something that could potentially happen, I reckon there is going to be a boundary throw-in and out of nowhere, the bloke who is going to be throwing the ball in with his big gut in fries his umpiring gear. Yes, you guessed it. None other than Jarmo. Boys, I, I tell you, I, I, now that would be the day. How he's going to get himself into WA, I'm really not too sure, but probably won't see. And I should add, we maybe don't want to see again. I don't think either team's going to be creating a, a power stance when we have the national anthem. Don't think there'll be that. And as we saw a couple of years later in 2019, we hope that um, we haven't got a side that kicks three goals for the entire game. We don't want the fat lady singing at the five or Rex six Hunt. minute mark of the second quarter. Come on! Where's Rex at? <laughs> oh, he'll he'll somehow sneak in a, into WA, potentially on a fishing yeah. vessel, gentlemen. <laughs> It's it's very possible. I think if you, <laughs> it'd be like the uh, it'd be like the the old school ashes tours. I think you know traveling by boat. I am definitely looking forward to this grand final. It is going to be an absolute ripper. Thank you so much again for joining me on this episode of In the Ballpark. And wow, what a grand final we have coming up. Hopefully, one for the ages. I have a good feeling. This one's going to be a ripper. Can't wait for it. Thanks, sir. Looking forward to it. Didn't think we'd have two in a row out of Victoria, I'm sure. October last year, we we thought we'd never see anything of the like again. But here we are. And let's, I suppose, make the most of the occasion on uh, Saturday evening. Gents, enjoy the game. 
Thank you so much again for your company on In The Ballpark. Remember to watch our YouTube channel where the full episode that you're listening to right now will be along with a lot of fun content on our Instagram page as well. Don't we love that? Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the grand final and make sure you tune in next week for our massive review of the game and, of course, our big preview for the 2022 season. Thank you very much for joining us on In The Ballpark.